and welcome to another edition of geek to geek the segment on Geeks in Malaysia where I talk to a fellow geek to discuss their origin story and a little bit about the industry that they're involved with. I am Nick Dorian and on today's show we have a multi-award winning and Eisner award winning comic book artist Mr. Sunny Liu. Welcome Sunny Liu, welcome to geek to geek uh, How are you feeling today? Feeling good today. Thanks, Thanks for having me on the show, Nick. Have you had your breakfast yet? That's something we always have to ask. <laughs> uh, not quite yet. I, I start my days a bit later, usually. <laughs> so, this is, you know, I'm having my, my morning drink right now. <laughs> so, for those of you who are unaware, Sunny Liu is a incredibly talented and prolific uh, illustrator and comic book artist. He's worked with people all over the globe. And we are here today to discuss basically his origin story. Now, I read that you actually grew, you were born in Suramban, is that correct? That's right, I was born in Suramban and uh, my parents sent me and my sister to Singapore when we were pretty young, right? I was probably five at the time, my sister was six, yeah. Uh, the, the reason I think they, they gave to me at least was that they wanted us to uh, learn stuff in English, because I think in, in Malaysia, the primary language at the time was Malay, right? So... For whatever reason, my parents decided that Singapore would be a might be a better place for us to 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 study. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then you moved over to Singapore. You studied at the uh, Victoria College, if I'm not mistaken. Well, a a, a bunch of places. Uh, Mah- Mahabudi Primary, Victoria School, uh, Victoria Junior College. After that, so all the way from six to eighteen, I was in Singapore at various schools. At what point in your childhood, was it your childhood or your adult career, did you decide to get into illustrations? Pretty late on. I mean, I've always had an interest in drawing, but I think that's most kids, right? Most kids, like, they like drawing things, making art. Uh, it's just that I never really stopped drawing. And I probably started to think of it as a possible career when I was 19, when I started doing a comic strip comic strip yeah comic strip for a paper in Singapore called the new paper and I think that's when you know the the experience of drawing comics and getting paid a bit of money for it made me think that this could be some kind of a career you know how did the new paper come about um the folly of youth I guess (laughs) I I was just I was back in Singapore on, on holiday from from school in the UK I had like a summer break of uh, maybe what, two months, I think. And I decided to draw my own comic strip and, and I sent it into the two local papers, Straits Times and New Paper. And I got a call back from the new paper to, to do a daily strip for them. Now, after graduating from college, you went over to the Rhode Island School of Design. Now, what fueled your decision to head over there? Well, after I graduated and I came back to Singapore, um, see, this was after I'd done the comic strip and I was keen to try out doing art but I had no idea what, what, what that involved right so I, I asked some friends who had been to art school what, what I should do and, and they told me to just apply to companies companies that did illustrations and stuff like that so I just random, randomly looked up companies on back then were still yellow pages right uh, and found some companies that did illustrations and I got a job doing something uh, for a company that did CD-ROMs for education um, so I, I, was, I was learning stuff, I was learning to draw, I was learning Photoshop and various other tools, but I was still feeling a bit frustrated because I wasn't doing comics, which is what I really wanted to do. Uh, so after a, about a year working at a company, my my sister who was work, studying in the US came back with a bunch of brochures right, from art schools. And because she knew, she knew I was interested in art, she brought me some brochures and I thought, why not go to art school, right, just to actually learn some stuff that because I, I was up to then I guess self-taught right very limited range of techniques very limited of uh, mediums uh, not much exposure to art beyond you know comics that I read so I figured going to art school would be a useful step forward in this dream I had of being an artist somehow yeah did you when you were studying did you were your main goals to illustrate like art or were you more focused into comics and like graphic novels and things like that? Uh, I guess a bit of everything, right? Because I, I, one thing I was really keen to learn was colour because I've been working black and white, uh, you know, up, up to that stage, just pen and ink and uh, pencil. 
So color was like a whole something I knew nothing about, right? I, I would try to go go to libraries and look up art books on painting, and I had no idea what those things were: acrylic, gouache, oil. <laughs> I had no idea, no clue what those different mediums were about, and no idea what color theory was. So, <laughs> you know, art school was partly to learn color painting, different techniques, but I was also focused on comics. So I did take uh several classes on graphic on graphic narratives. Uh. I was lucky that the teacher at the time at the school was, uh, I think you know this guy, David Master Kelly, right? So he, he oh, was like this, okay. uh, still is, right? One of the, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, daredevil, astropolis, astro all the stuff. Yeah, so, so he, he, he kind of knew the, the industry inside out. And he was the first person I met who could actually give me uh, some kind of guidance on how to become a comic artist if I wanted to follow the path. Yeah, so, so his, his class was interesting because we, we were only supposed to take his class once, right? Because, because it, it was it was an elective that you could only take once, but he knew that a lot of us wanted to take his class several times. So every year he would change his course number, so we could take it again and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to learn from the greats, he's got to figure out ways not to make it too easy for everyone to take his class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, were there yeah, any yeah. artists that inspired you at the time that you looked up to? Oh, um. Well, the, the one who inspired me to actually draw the first comic for a new paper would have been Bill Watterson, because I, I loved Kevin and the Hobbs when I was in school, right? Uh, before that, there were a bunch of... I, I used to read 2080 quite religiously for a time. So, of course, you know, Alan Moore, Simon Beasley, uh, all those UK guys. Um, but once I, once, I, once I started doing comics, I think I started to discover all this indie stuff, right? So people like Chester Brown, uh, Raw Magazine and these these days I will probably mention people like Chris Ware and uh, Daniel Clovis as being inspirations. Now, after graduating, you went to go and uh, have do a project with Vertical Comics called uh, My Faith in Frankie. How did you get your foot into Vertical Comics or that project in particular? Well, so I asked David, what should I do? <laughs> and, and he told me to do two things, right? One was to go to Comic, go to comic Con, which was uh, to show my portfolio around. And the other thing was to send in my portfolio to DC Vertigo. Because my, my style is a bit, was and is a bit um, left of center, as they call it. So he, he thought it might be a good fit with, with Vertigo. Um, and he actually, he actually made a call, I think, to uh, Karen Berger at the time to kind of alert them that, I, that one of the students was sending in a portfolio. So it, it, it wouldn't be lost in the pile of submissions. Um, wow. <laughs> but I, actually what happened was that they, they actually offered me another script before that, right? Be, before Faith and Frankie, it was called uh, Fables, right? Which turned out to be a big, big hit for them. Um, but I, I wasn't quite ready at the time, I think, to do a proper series. And, and my submissions, my sort of sketches for that uh, pitch wasn't up to scratch, I would say. Yeah. So se- several several weeks or months later, they offered me this mini series instead, which was, I think was much more my, I think my level at the time because I wasn't, I was no, no experience in the industry, didn't know how to pace myself and all those things. So it was probably the the best entry point I could have, lah. Yeah. Okay. Now, as an artist at Comic Con, because I mean, we all know people go to Comic Con, they experience everything as a fan, but. From an artist's point of view, was it very nerve-wracking to get your portfolio viewed by some of the biggest comic book artists there? It was, it was interesting. I think at, at the time, they, they still did uh, actual port review, port, portfolio reviews on site. Right Nowadays, it's, I think they, they don't, don't do that anymore. But back then, you could queue in a line and sort of like uh, show your stuff to the editors there. And, you know, I remember looking, looking at other people's portfolios and a lot of them were, like, not very good. But there were a couple of good ones, you know. And, and yeah, it, it was... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was nerve-wracking. It was just a new experience for me, right? I I, I never gone through a portfolio re- review before. So it, it was just interesting to see the reactions of people uh, to the work. And, and most of it, I would say, was positive. Um, I got a few leads, including... Uh, one from Chris Clermont at the time. I had no idea who he was. It was this old guy sitting at the Marvel booth? Oh. I, was, I was going everywhere. Oh. I went to everyone who was there. Right? Sorry, I didn't know Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont, right? So I, I showed my portfolio, and he said, and he liked it enough that he took a break from his uh, signing to go show, uh, introduce me to his friends around the booth and and stuff. And I actually got to do a small project for Marvel at the time. You know, so 
Yeah, and I found out later he was Chris Chris Claremont. I had no idea who he was at the, at the moment in time. <laughs> that's that's one of the big ones for sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, in 2011, you were nominated for an Eisner Award for your work on Wonderland, which uh, was with Disney. How did that feel, being nominated for one of the most prestigious awards in in comic books and in graphic novels? I would say it was very, it was an honour, it was exciting. Because um, I remember seeing people who had won Eisner's at, at Comic Con, right? So I went there, uh, they, they would display their trophies after they, they won it the previous night. And I thought to myself, when would I, ever, would I ever get a chance to be nominated or even win one of these things? And it seemed like such a distant dream. Uh, so to, to have been nominated was a, a big thing, I think, at the time. Now, moving on to a slightly more obscure comic, The Green Turtle. Now, for people who don't know, The Green Turtle uh, debuted in Blazing Comics and was one of the earliest Asian-American superheroes. He didn't really have much of a power. He was just really skilled and flew in a turtle plane. How did you make that cool? <laughs> oh, that, that was all Jin Yang, right? Because Jin, uh, you know, obviously people know Jin Yang. He's most of his work has been concerned with uh, Asian American identity and sort of uh, politics. And I think a friend of his probably alerted him to, to this, uh, the original Green Turtle, and he did some research on it and discovered that throughout that run that he had in, in the old comics, uh, he, would, he was never able to explain his origins, right? Because uh, whenever he wanted to tell people where he came from, there'd be some emergency that he had to go, go, go uh, solve. Right? So he, he ran off to, to fight some, some, some bad guys. And, and so Gene figured, you know, why not tell this origin story that was never told right and we had worked before on a couple of short projects and i think we enjoyed the sort of the collaboration so he asked me to uh draw this comic and i thought yeah sure of course what sort of inspirations did you draw to go into your uh in your interpretation hmm. of the green turtle uh i suppose I, I did try to look a bit at um what's this guy's name Ooh, escapes me now. Milton Kanif, I think his name is C A N I F, uh, who was this uh comic book comic strip artist from the I want to say forties, right? Because his his style is kind of uh I, I think very of that that era and very uh it, it felt suited to 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 the the story. So I, I did try to look at that a bit, but um I I think as as with most most things, once you start drawing, your own style sort of meshes together with that style you're trying to emulate, and you get this. Uh, sort of strange hybrid. Yeah. Now, moving on to one of your most prolific projects, The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai. Now, this, this is where I personally first found out about you because when I was working over in Singapore, this was everywhere. Mm. There was news about it everywhere. There was controversy behind it. I saw it like... It was almost like this... This novel that was hidden in the sides of uh, what do you call it bookstores that was like oh this is this is dangerous this is a dangerous comic and I never understood why but uh, could you tell us we'll get into that but can you tell us first how did the inspiration for Charlie Chan come about uh, are you talking about the correct character or the book the idea of the book itself because it, they're kind of separate things I think uh, maybe let's start with the let's start with the idea of the book. The book, okay. So I, I have been, you know, being a comic artist, I guess I've been interested in the history of comics, right? To, to find out more about the, the medium and its development. So I've been reading books about comics history and I kind of began to realize that as I was reading about comics history, I was learning about real history in, in a sense, right? So in order to, for example, uh, learn about Robert Crumb was also to learn a little bit about the counter-cultural revolution in the U.S. in the 60s, 70s, right? And and uh, so I thought, why why not turn this on its head and do a book that appeared on the surface to be about comics history, but was actually about so-called real history uh, of, of Singapore, right? Because I think that that's actually a, a topic that's... Uh, Interesting to me, at least, you know, and I think interesting to Singaporeans and people who are interested in how narratives get uh, spun, right? So I, I thought I could flip it on its head and do a book that uh, appeared to be about one thing, but was actually about something else. And 
yeah, that, that was the basic conception of the idea. And what about the character himself? What, did you draw inspiration from your own life as well? Um, Charlie Chan, yeah. I mean, in, in the first place, the, the original idea for the book was supposed to be a uh, history of Singapore comics. It was supposed to feature at least half a dozen different artists you know, but uh, as I began work on the book, I realized that this would be too much to handle uh, in terms of just getting the reader to follow all the different threads, right? So it became, it part down to just one artist, Charlie. Uh, and Charlie Chan, I guess, is... is some of his experiences are, are, are based on my own experiences, but actually very little of it. Uh, his visit to Comic Con was a little bit based on my own visit to San Diego Comic Con. But... In general, I think his 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 sort of path is a a, a composite of uh, a lot of different artists' journey, right? I think a lot of artists' journey have a similar trajectory in in the sense that you begin with the hopes and the struggles, and then you reach some kind of a high point, and then it kind of declines. And, and I think that that arc is uh, very common to a lot of artists' career. So I, I was able to draw on uh, the biographies of different artists to to create Charlie Chan. Now, coming to the controversial part of it, uh, for some reason, Singapore cited this as a potential to undermine the authority of the government. Would you say, I mean, this is a bit of a touchy subject, but how did you feel towards all the criticism coming from the higher ups in Singapore? Well, in in a sense, it wasn't really something I could respond to because they never really made it clear what the... uh, issue was with the book, right? Uh, so so be, be, beyond that press release where they said that, you know, it undermined the authority and of the government, it, it, uh, I was never told directly or in any clear terms what the issues actually were, right? So I, I've heard things over the years about what could have been the case, you know, through, through, through friends or people who knew people, but uh, it's never been official. So it's, it's not, I, I can't respond directly to something which has never been presented to me, right? So... My my own guess is that it's it's mainly about, I mean, I, it's something I, I kind of knew at the time that I was in a way questioning the mainstream narrative about our history in Singapore, right? And, and that's, I think, uh, you know, always going to be a bit of a touchy subject for them because that, that's the story they they wanted to tell and sell, right? So if you challenge that narrative, it's uh, it will be a, an issue at some level. I find it interesting as well because not even in Singapore but even in Malaysia as well that comic book artists seem to have the government seems to have a bit of a sore spot for comic book artists who talk anything to do without politics or the history of Malaysia even with uh, Zuna and Fami Reza recently how do you feel towards how comic books or even artists in general seem to provoke the government in a way that shouldn't really provoke a government? Well, I, I guess it depends on how you th- how much impact you think an artist has, right? And I think Zuna, for example, has, has quite had quite a big impact on Malaysian politics, right? A lot of, pe- a lot of people read his comics and they actually respond to it. So in, in that sense, I'm not sure that the government's like antipathy towards Zuna is misplaced. <laughs> okay. For Charlie Chan, what would be next? Because there's already been a stage play for Charlie Chan. Is there any opportunity perhaps to maybe a web series or even more a TV series or some sort of podcast or a project for for uh, Charlie Chan? I've, I've actually um, I've actually signed a well not signed a contract but I've uh, th- there is a project in the works right with, with a Singapore production company that's trying to make a TV series slash movie out of it and it's uh, they, they've done like a basic script bible and now they're looking for producers directors etc to bring it to the next step so so it, it's sort of in production but in a very early very early stages okay now if to slowly wrap this up what's next for you are there any projects opening up for you or any future works um, so, a book that I've been working on the last couple of years is uh, with a an academic from Singapore called uh, Red Lines. Uh, the the academic name is Charon George, and he's a professor in media studies. And he's we've done a book that's essentially about uh, censorship 
that cartoonist face around the world, right? So he he spoke to people everywhere from the U.S., China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, to find out different kinds of censorship that people faced around the world. Uh, and I guess comics sort of censorship is for for him a window into larger censorship, right? Because I I think the the pressures that people face in comics is uh represents an, you know the wider picture of censorship and and that book would be out I think later this year from MIT Press. Um, for myself, I've been working on a couple of projects. One is for an art exhibition that should be out quite soon. And the other one is a, a long running project which I've been trying to figure out for the past three years. Uh, I've been telling people it's about capitalism, which can it gives you an idea of how broad a pro- topic this is, which is why I'm still at some level struggling to find the right structure and you know context for this for this story I want to tell. Okay. And if you were to give any advice for up and coming <laughs> illustrators or comic book artists, what advice would they give them? Oh no, the dreaded advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean we have to answer ask this question all um, the time. I would say that every okay, what kind of what can I can I give? I, I guess one thing that makes sense would be to try to do the work, right? Just, just get your work out there, right? I think um, in, in so far as some people are afraid to show their work, I think that that should be overcome because the only way you can improve is to continually do new work and get reactions from pe- from readers and editors, writers, right? So I think comics, like any other art, is a craft and it's a craft that can only get better by actually doing it, right? Actually getting reactions and learning from mistakes or, you know, finding what, what works and uh, refining those things. So don't, don't be afraid to show your work and, and just make make something. I think that that's, would be my <laughs> main advice. Can I, can I ask you about your uh, Ghostbuster car behind you? Oh, this! Um, it's actually the Ghostbusters, yes, yeah, it's the Ghostbusters Lego set. Oh, Lego set. Oh, cool. Because I, I can't tell from, from this system whether it's like a... Yeah, it's for oh, the really upcoming cool. yeah. Ghostbusters mm. Afterlife, <laughs> which was, I mean, supposed to premiere last year. Are, are you looking forward to the new movie? Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly looking forward to the upcoming Ghostbusters. I mean, not to say anything up, uh, bad about the female reboot. It was what it was. Uh, and all power to them for doing something like that. But having, having the original Ghostbusters come back and having the... Ivan Reitman's son, no less, directing it is something that I'm incredibly looking forward to. What about you? Uh, I I would I would go watch this one. The the, the previous one I I didn't. I just saw some trailers, but this one I I'd be interested to watch. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean uh, the the previous one, the fem- all female Ghostbusters. Uh, it is what it is. It's a fun watch, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> That's the best I can say. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for spending your time with me today, Sunny. Uh-huh. It's been a pleasure talking to you, finding out more about your origin story and the industry a mm. little bit. Thanks, Nick. Uh, sorry, the delay was a bit strange, but hopefully you will get... <laughs> yeah, the delay is a bit strange. Uh, if, if anybody would like to follow you and follow your work, are there any social media accounts they should be following? Uh, the main one, I guess, would be Instagram, as you know, usual these days. It's uh, sunny, sunny underscore Liu. Right. So sunny underscore Liu, yeah. Uh, there's also a website sunnyliu.com if you want to go to visit it and on, yeah. All right, mm. and that'll be all this week on Geek to Geek. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to the conversation. If you'd like us to talk to anybody in the industry, do let us know. You can email us at geeksinmalaysia at gmail.com or follow us on any of our socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Let us know there at Geeks in Malaysia or alternatively, you can head to geeksinmalaysia.com. You can find all our things there. And of course, not forgetting, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe to youtube.com slash geeks in Malaysia. That'll do it for us this week. I am Nate Dorian. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, keep geeking out, yo.